Um, so, uh, first question. There is a short, short introduction already mentioned by you, Nanya, but I just want to focus on um, who am I, what am I doing now? So I'm a postdoc researcher at IDEV in Leipzig in Germany. Um, and I work, more what I do um, in my day, usual, usual days, is I work on three different things. Uh, I'm working a lot on trait-based ecology, so I develop R packages for that, uh, think about methods, and as well as uh, doing some analysis. Um, these days, I'm working a lot on invasion and invasive uh, species, especially plants. Uh, working mostly with the GLONAF data, so the Global Naturalized uh, Alien Flora database, uh, which gives us an idea of every alien uh, all alien plant species in the world. And also, I'm a macroecologist, so I do a lot of large-scale uh, studies. So this is one uh, example of uh, a thing I've done, uh, working on coral reef fishes at global scale. Uh, so you may ask yourself, okay, it seems like he's a regular po oh, yeah. I already include all of my contact details. If you're interested in talking about any of the thing already, like any of these three topics or what we're going to uh, talk about today, uh, feel free to contact me, email, Twitter, Mastodon. Uh, I have my website. I'm always happy to chat about all, all of these things. So anyway, and uh, yeah, so let's get started. Uh, why am I in front of you here? Well, uh, Juliana uh, really happily, as she mentioned, uh, contacted me quite a while ago to make this lecture. Uh, and it was because this paper got published. So I, uh, in my first year of postdoc in, uh, in Leipzig, I actually work on something totally unrelated to my actual postdoc project as research goes. And I published with uh, my fellow um, IDIV colleagues uh, this paper on harmonizing taxon names. And this is what we're going to talk about today and the reason why I'm here today. So uh, I'm going to explain more of the, the more in detail uh, what is harmonizing, harmonizing taxon names and probably you had the problem, you had a problem. But if you want to have anything more specific that goes into uh, like the teeny tiny details, the methods, uh, you can refer to this paper. Um, so the program of this lecture is quite simple. Um, we're going to, I'm going to start to explain a little bit what is taxonomy. I don't know exactly what is your background in terms of taxonomy. So just let's have a brief talk about taxonomy in itself. Then let's talk about taxonomic harmonization, a problem that you certainly faced uh, in the past. Then let's look at what do we need to perform taxonomic harmonization and how to do it in practice. Uh, so first, what is taxonomy? So you get, you have to think about like the, the immense diversity of life and it's actually taxonomy is the basis of all ecology. Why is this the basis of all ecology? Because we need to name things and taxonomists do exactly that. They name things and uh, they need to define the entities on which we're working on. So you may be interested in looking at the impacts of humans on certain species, but you first have to define these species. So taxonomists are absolutely paramount to work. And I suppose for all of you who were not never trained, like me, never trained in taxonomy, it may be difficult to conceive. Um, we also absolutely need for our work to uncover the evolutionary uh, relationship between organisms in order to know which organisms are similar or not. And this is also the job of taxonomists. And finally, maybe it it's it's obvious, but historically, taxonomy came before ecology. People started naming things before they were actually um, they were actually interested in the relationship with their environment. So taxonomy is actually the basis of all ecology, and we it's really needed. So why should you care? Okay, maybe you're interested in what I, what I like. Maybe okay, taxonomists they do their things, they they define entities, but why should I care about taxonomy specifically? Okay, very concrete question. How many species of giraffes are there in the world? Well, um, depending on who you ask, there could be one, two, or more. And this has very strong implication for conservation programs. Because depending on who you, how you define a species, maybe the giraffe is threatened, maybe it's not. 
so we need taxonomies to actually perform this work. And this has been the topic, for example, of this publication, uh, showing that there may be four to five different species of giraffes. This, um, I'm showing you this example because I think it's a very clear example how taxonomy has very concrete, uh, concrete implications. Because of course, if you imagine there's a southern, southern species of giraffe and one northern species of giraffe, then it means like there's a big range and the species is not threatened so much. Whereas if you split it in that many, among the, that many species, then each of them individually are threatened. So of course, the conservation actions that you're going to take are going to be different. So we should definitely care about taxonomy. Um, I have to add that though, there's a little asterisk here uh, that this paper is still like this uh, split of um, giraffe species is still heavily debated. So I'm not a specialist of giraffe taxonomy, so I'm not stepping into the debate, but it's just a funny example of where taxonomy is relevant. Also, everything is indexed by species names. If you work with biological data, uh, when you think about it, the first entry you have is, okay, what, uh, what species do you want to have data for, from? If you go to the GBIF, which, occur, which have occurrence data, you already have the species. If you go to the TRI database, which is a database of plant functional trait, they will ask you if you want to request uh, your data by species names. Or if you want to go to the IUCN red list for the threat status, it actually shows you, it actually shows you the names. So you need the species name to work. So we definitely need to think about all of these names. Even though we're not taxonomists, we need to think about them. Okay, just very briefly, how do taxonomic work? Taxonomists work? Um, well, they use multiple approach, approaches. So where the DNA, morphology, behavioral traits, and many other kinds of observations. And from that, they try to establish new species, or new relationships between species. Also, I'm saying species here, but it was it, it would be more um, more relevant to use the term taxa because it could be also at other uh, taxonomic level than species. But I'm I were I'm mostly interested in species. I'm just using species here as a broader term. Uh, then, based on this, they published their findings in peer review uh, peer review journals uh, into specialist journals. Uh, have you ever read a tech, an article in a taxonomic journal? I never. I never did. It's not what I do. And this is not what we're doing. So we have to rely on that. And then from these peer review publication, there is some discussion in the taxonomic community to build consensus to achieve a, 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 a taxonomy for an, an, on which everybody is agrees. The problem here, I mean, the problem, one of the issues is this is a scientific process and you may have different scientific opinions on a given species. So you may have conflicting opinions and this is just a state of science because these are scientific opinions. And of course, as, as with science, it not always agree on a one single direction. Um, so, from that, we need to aggregate taxonomic knowledge. And people do aggregate taxonomic knowledge to achieve the consensus. We, they, the taxonomists, you use a diversity of sources. So here you have some sources and a funny image that bugged for whatever reason. So actually taxonomic journals plus one historical source, the Dutch land flora. And all of this information is scattered among different papers, publications, databases. So we absolutely need to assemble them and taxonomists need to assemble them through taxonomic databases. So here you have two examples of taxonomic databases, Catalog of Life and the World Register of Marine Species, worms. And these databases aggregate all of the taxonomic information from these different databases based on different, um, based on individual or community creation, they provide an up-to-date taxonomy of different sets of species. And this is what, so this is what I can say in general about what is taxonomy. So if I just make a quick summary, okay, taxonomy is at the basis of ecology and biodiversity sciences. No quite, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's a controversial opinion. Its main goal is to discover and distinguish different species or taxa. 
taxonomic information is within papers and is aggregating into databases. And these databases are called taxonomic reference databases. I, I mean, they're called, this is the expression that we decided in the paper uh, and my co-authors to use. Um, we can call them taxonomic reference databases, but you, you will see you're going to, if you go into the literature, you're going to see a lot of different terms used, but I'm just calling them here, taxonomic reference database. And they provide updated taxonomic backbones for other, other data. Okay. So what is taxonomic harmonization as it's supposed to be the title of my lecture? Taxonomic harmonization, I mean, one of the things that you have to consider is that we have uh, increasing uh, uh, data size in ecology with increasing volume uh, through remote sensing, for example, variety with a lot of scientists, uh, scientists field data, uh, a lot of veracity that we didn't, cannot trust, the cities in science, and higher velocity in the sense that the sensors are sampling a lot uh, during time. So the data are getting larger and some aspects of big data. Um, I um, um, I'm I don't like I put big data quote unquote because I don't like the expression big data and I don't think we're actually um, we're actually uh, having problems with big data in uh, in ecology in the sense that we're most in most cases our data sets are small data in the sense that they're fitting in a single computer so it's not yet big data but. It may, it may depends on which field you're working in. Um, and the problem is we're, we're getting a larger number of species that are measured. More and more species get measured. So meaning that we have more and more. Um, uh, the problem is all of these data are indexed by species name. OK. So again, other example, iNaturalist, just because I like and show you that species are still, species names are still the most important index that we have. For example, if you want to get data from iNaturalist, with the head that provide occurrence data and identification, then you have index by species name. If you want to have, if you go to the species space, they provide occurrence, traits of species, pictures, and much more data. And they ask you for the name again. Or if you want to go to algae base, you're interested in algae. We have distribution, pictures, and taxonomy for al algae. They ask you to use, okay, taxon names, but this is also species names. So we're getting a lot of more data. Everything is indexed by, um, by species names. The problem that we're going to face is how we're going to merge all of these data. Imagine I'm interested in two data sets. One gave me the conservation status of different species. The other one gave me the traits of some species. Here I can try to get the list of species names um, in both data sets. The question I'm asking myself is, are the species names the same? You could, either, uh, you, you could say, maybe I'm interested in only, uh, in only matching the names directly, but maybe the name changed between the time the both data sets were acquired. Because you know, as I told you, taxonomy is a scientific opinion. So the, uh, the, the consensus can actually change across time, a long time. So you actually need to get the list of names from each data set separately and match them against a taxonomic reference database. And this database actually holds the taxonomic concept. And here, for example, you can see that species one and six are considered the same. That's why they're in the same box. So even though they have different names, they're actually the same species. And taxonomic harmonization is exactly this process where you get the, 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 the you compare the list of species uh, that you have in one data set onto a reference database. And with that, you can then merge it with a different data set. So if I want to take a very concrete example, uh, let's say I'm interested in looking at um, the relationship between bird extinction risk and biomass. So this is an example from my normal and colleagues 2020. And so I have two data sets. One is conservation status and the other one is biomass. And um, these are my two lists of species. So I have this list of species on the left 
that list of species in the right. Uh, let you just very briefly look at the name of species. Let's say I'm not interested in doing any sort of taxonomic harmonization. I just want to match the names directly from both data sets. There's only two species in common, this uh, Margot Perdrix and this Falcipenes um, species. So I only have two species in common, but come on, let, let's have a closer look. You can see that, oh, it's funny, all of these epithets, Pipile, Cumanensis, Cuyubi, Yacuntica, they're also the same here. Hmm. Well, if you perform taxonomic harmonization, you actually have six species in common. So taxonomic harmonization, comparing through like a reference database, and in this case, it was Avipase, it can make data sets comparable. So in case you have two different data sets, they were acquired at different time or working with different taxonomic are harmonized against different taxonomic the database, reference databases, then you absolutely need to perform taxonomic harmonization. You're never sure that the taxonomy hasn't changed between both of them. Otherwise, you're going to miss and throw uh, out of the window a lot of your data. What should you care about taxonomic harmonization? Well, it increases the match names, uh, so you're not throwing out data. Um, also, the taxonomy could have been updated between the time of acquire, uh, acquire uh, of the, the two data sets that you want to merge. Also, it means that you can then use the last up-to-date taxonomy for your analysis. So it means that then when you provide the, 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 the data of your analysis, because you're going to open the data as we learn, uh, as you learned during this, uh, this week, um, and you're going to share it if you want, um, you, can, you can provide the last uh, up-to-date taxonomy with it. So quick summary, taxonomic harmonization is the process of matching um, the species names against species reference databases, taxonomic reference database. Taxonomic harmonization is actually necessary with the increasing size of data sets in ecology. And manual harmonization is too hard. Esteban shared uh, his story about uh, matching the names uh, manually. I wouldn't wish anyone to do this, and I would prefer to rely on automated tools to do that, especially with 350 names. Sounds like a, a huge amount of work. Um, with taxonomic harmonization, we can resolve given uh, species names into updated ones and take care of synonyms as well, because the database will indicate which names are synonyms or not. So what do you need to perform taxonomic harmonization? The first thing you need is our sources. So these are taxonomic reference databases, as I keep calling them. What are these exactly? Taxonomic reference databases, also named taxonomic backbone, taxonomic checklist, taxonomic authority, taxonomic database. You're going to see different terms. There's no clear definition of what they are. But for me, when I say taxonomic reference database, I'm thinking about this kind of information. It's a centralized repository of nomenclatural information with nested uh, taxonomic information with the different levels. Of course, it doesn't have to, whoop, yep. Of course, it doesn't have to go up to the life uh, box or the domain uh, box, but sometimes it's rather like to the class level or to the film level. But the important thing is centralized repository of normal control information. It can also provide some spelling correction right into it and some synonym resolution because it may have include a lot of synonyms, which is always uh, nice. What are examples of taxonomic reference databases? So one that you can think of is the GBIF backbone. So the GBIF backbone is the taxonomy, the taxonomy that is built behind GBIF to support all of the data sets. It's at the global scale, and it has no taxonomic restriction in the sense that it, it includes taxa from every branches of life. And in June 2021, it contained 6.6 .6 million names, 3.7 million of which were accepted, and 2.6 were considered synonyms. So you already see, wow, that's a lot of synonyms. Yes, because taxonomic, taxonomists actually do a lot of um, double work. Some people discover twice the same species and then they name it differently. And then we have to resolve synonyms. Another example could be the Leipzig catalog of vascular plants. 
uh, LCVP, which is the global taxonomy for plants. So it's global and it's more, more focusing on vascular plants as the name uh, tell, as the name tells. And in November, 2020, it contained 1.3 million names, 350,000 of which were accepted and the rest were synonyms. Yes, plant taxonomy is a mess. Uh, as you see, you have different uh, spatial scales and taxonomic breadth of taxonomic reference databases. The important thing is you can divide the taxonomic references, uh, reference databases across two, diff two different um, axes. The first one is uh, taxonomic breadth. So you have um, databases focusing on single taxonomic groups like vascular plants, uh, larger taxonomic groups like animals or all taxonomic groups, meaning they have no uh, taxonomic restriction, no, no clear taxonomic re restriction. I'm seeing eukaryota here because it's rare to have a taxonomy that has eukaryota and prokaryota and archaea together, but still. So you have these three different uh, taxonomic breadth that are possible. And also we define two different spatial scale. So the regional scale, which is like more focused and global. Glo regional could be anything from a given country to a continent. So if we take our examples for our previous examples, so here would be the GB backbone. It contains all taxonomic groups and it's at global scale. And here you have uh, the LCVP, which is also a global scale, but focusing on single taxonomic groups. And you can find example of, um, of database for in each cases. So here you have some names. You, you don't need to, to know them, but this, this are all examples that we, we could find. Um, so you see that taxonomic reference database come in different shapes and sizes. Also, one of the difficulty if you're interested in databases is that you have to be aware of their connections. Actually, because uh, gathering the, the taxonomic information is very expensive because all of it is very scattered and then you have to build consensus, um, the, um, the databases are not always original. They generally rely on each other. And so what we did is we drew a network of the relationship between database. So here I show you a data, um, a network of different databases, the taxonomic reference databases that we included um, in our paper. And they show a relationship from the source to the target. So where is the taxonomic information coming from and where it is going? So you see that you have strong connections and what we can see is we have, uh, so for example, LCVP is actually feeding its information to GBIF. And, and you have other like, so WCVP, so the word checklist of vascular plants is actually giving its information to POVO, to plants of the world online. I know the names are horrible. You have a lot of acronyms. These are databases in the end. So of course they have strange and complicated names. So you can see that some databases are widely reused. So you see here, you have three, three links coming from Tycho, for example. And you have some mega aggregator databases. So some are very central. So Wikipedia, because Wikipedia is gathering data from all of these databases. Also GBIF or the Global Names Resolver. Um, so always when you go into a database and you're interested in one taxonomy group in particular, you have to ask yourself the question, where is this information actually coming from? If it's, is it coming from another database, then maybe you should rather go to this original database if you're only interested in this taxonomic group. Something that this graph doesn't convey is that this information is very, very difficult to gather. And I'm not even talking quantitatively because we try to put numbers in these links and it's actually very complex because this information is not provided by the database, uh, the database managers. We had to manually email them, ask them several times for, and we don't have the answers for every, uh, each of them. And we had to dive into the data sets that are ourselves to figure out, okay, what are the relationships? So we described the landscape of tools. Now let's go, uh, the landscape of sources. Now let's go to the tools. So in the paper, and what I'm going to advertise for you is to use the R packages because most of this taxonomic harmonization work, if you're working with a lot of species, can be handled by automatically by R packages. If you're lucky enough to have a taxonomic reference database and 
uh, an R package to uh, the, the, that is tied to this database on your taxonomy group of interest. So what we did is we did a review of packages on Cron, GitHub, and Bioconductor. And we had to manually create uh, the, the list of packages we found from standard queries. So we did GitHub code search and use uh, another um, search engine for our packages. Based on that, we decided, OK, different criteria to include or not the package in our, in our review. So it had to be a real R packages and a real R package, so not a collection of scripts because we found plenty collection of scripts, but this, this was not considered a tool. Uh, it shouldn't be a wrapper because you have a lot of packages that say, oh, we, we, you, we actually provide taxonomic information, but they rely on another package to get this taxonomic information. It has not to be about genomics. We excluded genomics because we felt it was out of our comfort zone for, for one, and it's working totally differently in terms of taxonomy. So I want, if you're interested in doing uh, taxonomic assassination, uh, et cetera, that I, it's very interesting, but it's just outside of our scope because it's already like just working on organism without, without working with the geno genomes and only working with the taxonomic databases is already complex in itself. So if you want to do taxonomic assassination, it exists, it's possible. We are, you have packages for that, but we're not talking about this today. So in total, we identified 68 packages and of which 59 were included in our list. So did you even know that there were 59 packages to work with taxonomy in R? Before doing this review, I didn't because we were missing a global overview. And we identify packages for different purposes. So we classify them into four categories. So we had packages that were providing infrastructure. So to build upon to make new packages, for example, the taxa package provides general classes to build other packages. There were three packages in this category. Then you had the largest category by far, the database access category. So these are all um, packages that uh, access different databases. So for example, taxes, uh, taxa is access many databases and taxa.db offers offline access to taxonomic information. Then you had a lot of data, data wrangling packages. So they can actually work with data and, and modify the taxonomic, uh, the taxonomic information there or let you aggregate or summarize the data. And in there you have, for example, RG and parser that parses names into different components. And I'm going to talk about this in the next section of the lecture. And then you have only two visitation packages. So they can let you have nice graphs of taxonomy. So um, here, um, so if you want to have the complete list of packages, uh, you can refer to the paper. You have like the 59 packages that are uh, quite extensively described and they're, they're, the, the, what they do is clearly described in the, in, the, in the text. So what we did is we, we made from that, we made a package dependency network. We were interested in knowing, okay, to what extent are packages relying on one another? This is the picture. So, uh, yeah, uh, mostly, and then, no, yeah, no, no, uh, everybody, is there everything? I don't know, it's only, it's mostly, it's mostly database access. No, it's only, no, no, it's every, every package, sorry. Uh, I wasn't sure anymore. So here, uh, here a link indicates that one package rely on another um, to access data, data, for example. So for example, tag size is actually using NatServe, Worms, or Metacoder. And what you see is it's a very disconnected network. Uh, so very few packages are reusing each other, which is uh, uh, not a nice thing. Apart from our open side packages. So here, uh, if the circle is black, it actually are open side packages. And if you look up, the packages that are like that have black circles are actually much more connected than the others. Also, funny thing, uh, just to light up something, um, there's one taxonomic database for plants that is called, uh, oh yeah, take, thanks Daniel to provide the links, link to the paper. Um, the one database in for plants is called the plant list. It has, it's totally outdated. Uh, it's been outdated for the last seven years. And in blue are the packages that I still access it. And you see that there are seven packages that access the exact same database. And I don't think, we would need, as users, seven packages to access the exact same data. So this also shows that maybe before developing 
an R package to access taxonomic data, you should think about looking at what exists. So in case you're considering for your taxonomic group because you have a small data set or to build up a tool for that, check beforehand that none, like none other exists. Uh, and many packages provide the same source. So um, this is quite concerning for the, the, the for both the developers and the users to know which tools are we supposed to use, how are, are these things robust, and it seems there's no standard. Uh, so now we can uh, connect sources and packages, and this is what we did. So we built a Shiny app that displays, and I'm going to share my screen now. We built a Shiny app that let you navigate connect both the tools and the databases. So we built a full network and it's going to load, ta -da, where you have the packages in purple and the database in orange. And you can zoom in. Let's see, for example, uh, okay, uh, TPL, the plant list. So TPL, you can see, is actually feeding, you, you can see the link between, um, between packages, between databases, and between packages and databases. So you see it's feeding different databases. It's fed by some databases in, purple, in orange, and it's feeding Wordflora online and GBIF. And it's accessed by, um, by actually seven packages, the seven packages I was just talking about. And you see that this package, some of these packages are only accessing this database. So these three packages are only accessing this database. On the left, you can see that you have some information provided uh, for the database. So the name, its full name, which kind of noted it, the spatial scale, the taxonomic breadth, and the taxonomic group. You see, for example, that the last time it was updated was in 2013. So it's been, I said seven years, I was wrong, it's nine. So, um, and let's say you're interested, let's say you're interested in saying, okay, I am in looking for another database, like the, or another package, let's say, okay, I wanna look up all the databases that are accessed by tax size. Then I click, I can search here, click on tag size, and then I got my network provide and my network highlighted to show me all of the links to the different databases and all of the links to the packages. So with this tool, um, with this tool, you can actually look up for the database you're interested in or the tool you're interested in. Uh, and look up, okay, what uh, do, do my tool exist? What is connected to that? What are the links? Um, so this is the result of a work for this paper. And, um, and it's actually a living database in the sense that we're still updating it. Of course, it's quite difficult to get uh, all of this information. It was quite complex and we're not sure we're going to be able to maintain it for long. But still, we're still like ag aggregating more databases and more taxonomic packages. So if your favorite tool or database is not in there, write an email to me. I'll be happy to update the, the tool. Um, so we connected sources and packages to actually perform uh, taxonomic harmonization. Let's summarize a little bit what we've done. So taxonomic harmonization requires taxonomic, requires taxonomic reference databases. Uh, the database co cover various spatial scales and taxonomic breadth. Some larger databases aggregate smaller databases. And taxonomic harmonization also rely on tools which are diverse. So before diving into taxonomic harmonization, maybe pay an attention to the tools that exist to perform it. Because they may be automated tools and you may be save saving a lot of time. And I would hope, Esteban, that some tools would exist for your, for your automated tools that would exist for butterflies. But to my knowledge, butterflies, it's also quite complex. And some pa R packages, like size that you're probably aware of, access many databases, so they could be very nice entry points. Doesn't mean they're the best, doesn't mean that they access the database you're, interest you're necessarily interested in, but they could be a first, uh, a first tool to use. Um, so, um, how do we perform taxonomic harmonization in practice? Because for now, I describe what it is. You, several of you uh, sh sh told us about how they were actually doing this taxonomic harmonization and some of, some of the time manually. 
we have the database on one side, the tools on the other. How do we do? Um, so I really like this figure because it shows you the variety of spelling styles of taxonomic names. And this is one of the issue is that you have so many, depending on the source that you're using, whether they're historical, whether they're coming from different databases with different practices. Uh, the first problem you're going to you're going to have to solve is there's a diversity of ranking styles. We need to standardize it, and we need to identify the components of name, and th and then standardize the style from that. So, the first thing uh, you would need to do would be using partials to identify components of names. So this was the name, and here you all probably know that, but you had the genus name, the species name, then the author and the year, depending on the taxonomy group you're uh, focusing on, including the year or not is not standard. In some, some, in, in some uh, taxonomy groups, you're not including the years. In some, you are. But if you want to complete information, you're, you have to write it up like this. And there are some tools that actually provide that. The funny thing is we did this small exercise of identifying the, the components and then reassembling the names based on that and only matching the names based on identified components. In the BioTime database, we had 44,000 names using taxa first. And then after pre-processing like this by identifying the components of the different names, we had only 32,000, uh, I mean, close to 33,000. So what I want to say is, and we were using RGN parser, the GN parse function, but you have other another parser in the RGBIF package. So I would say, even if you don't have um, a taxonomic reference database in your taxonomic group of interest, you may, you should uh, think about the writing style of your names. Are they written in the same way? And also these parsers are, uh, can account for uh, double spaces, encoding errors, and, uh, and this kind of problem that oh, also Esteban pointed. So first of all, you need to identify the, the thing. Ah, yeah, also online. So you have the actual, um, the actual. Uh, you can either use the R packages, but you have also the online tools, if you're more comfortable with that, um, to actually uh, parse the different names. And it will output a table from this uh, chunk. It would output a table with genus, species, author, year, infra species. It, will, uh, it would all put a full table that is organized. And then already based on that, it's easier to provide to, to make a matching. So <clears throat> unfortunately for you, and I'm going to show you example of workflows. This is a very complex slide. And what I'm going to tell you is that, unfortunately, there is no one size fits all uh, taxonomic harmonization workflows. Because depending on your data set, depending on your taxonomy groups, um, different workflows may be appropriate. Also, it depends if you want to have speed, if you want to prioritize speed over accuracy. Sometimes you're interested in having very accurate species names. Sometimes it's more problem with speed, especially if you're matching thousands and thousands of names. So for sure, it always goes the same way. You always have to pre-process, and this is what I've told you as the most important step. Then you match against databases, and then you harmonize. So what we did in the paper is we proposed four different workflows on the biotime data set, database, which is very messy in terms of taxonomic names and were not standardized. And we see that we try to compare uh, the performance of the different workflows. Uh, if you want to see, I'm going to like, I'm just going to display the variety of the workflows here. So you have four different workflows that use the raw list, the corrected list, they use the entire list and matching, it, it's a list which with mixed taxonomy groups, plants and birds, matching uh, all the lists against both databases or pre, pre, prior to that identifying which names were plants, which name were birds, and then matching on specific databases. We compare all of these strategies. Depending on your, the, your strategy, what, what you're doing, they can be relevant. It's just for sure, it, it will always, I would suggest going in through these three different steps and I'm going to detail them now. If you wanna see the numbers the, and the functions we're using, every, the code is all open and please refer to the paper again. 
So uh, one of my first advice would be check encoding and special characters if you do this taxonomic harmonization workflow. Why? Because especially if you're working with uh, non-English sources, you have accented characters. And some, some taxonomic reference database will not like that. And it will make your matching uh, go wrong. So you should actually check for that. And I'm including here also taking into account double spaces, standardizing the spaces, making sure you have no uh, hidden characters. So try to standardize the encoding and the special characters in your names. Then, as I've told you already, parse your name into components. So then you have different components that you can match together. Then match the names against well-selected databases. I know it sounds very vague, but well-selected databases depend on your, your field. So you can select databases based on the taxonomic breadth. In general, the more specialized they are, the more detailed they contain, the more their spatial scale. You smaller databases tend to be smaller scale databases tend to be more up to date. But this is just a rule of thumb. Sometimes, like GBIF, GBIF is very much up to date. You could also select the database based on the data about that. The more recent, better reflect the current knowledge. So use a database that was recent, not the plant list if you're working with plants, because it's outdated for the last nine years. And it's considered non-standard. And all of the taxonomists are laughing a lot about this database, even though it's still like accumulating thousands of citations every year. Also, think about the number of synonyms. If you think you have a lot of synonyms, the more synonyms a database contain means that you're probably going to better resolve your names and better match them. So depending on your taxonomic group, keep in mind these four criteria and try to select the best database for your work. Then you have to resolve the names. So most databases output, like uh, this database, output a matching score. And they tell you, OK, I was looking for Rubus Rubus, and I got Rubus Rubus. This is the kind of score that they, are, they provide. And then you can find most of them, you, you can use a threshold. So based on this threshold, you can say, OK, if the score is above 98%, I'm going to consider that both names are equal. This is not perfect, because of course, there will be some errors. But there's no way with more than 1,000 names that you're going to manually resolve them. Unless you want to be a taxonomist, but if you, I, I suppose that if you're here, you're not a taxonomist, so you're actually working on some other issue than naming the speed, than correctly matching the names. So rely on the scores when they're they're existing, and again, depending on the taxonomic accuracy you want, you have different thresholds, and depending on the database you're using, the scores have different meanings. So I know it's still very abstract here, but depending on the taxonomic group you're interested in, the taxonomic reference database you're using, they will provide you with different scores. Make sure that you understand what are these scores and how you select. So in summary, for the workflow, what we're having is um, you need to check the encoding and the special characters. Then, you need to parse the names into the components. Then you match names against well-selected database. So not the plant list for plants. I'm still saying this because uh, the plant list was a big, uh, uh, like realizing how much it was used when we were writing our paper was a pain. And then you resolve the names. OK, what to do with unmatched names? And uh, we got some insights already from, from the audience for uh, what to do with your image names. One of, one of the things is check the spelling manually. Maybe some of your automated corrections actually didn't, didn't uh, correct for some of the errors. Second, drop them. If you're working with thousands of species and you have several hundred unmatched names, maybe you just cannot work with them. They're not found in any database. And maybe you should drop them. Or if you have a lot of names, I mean, uh, I forgot a fourth option, which was actually manually going to the database and focusing them. You can test them against aggregated databases. So I'm going to show you what is what are these aggregated databases, like the global names verifier. 
uh, it's a giant database. So here, if you look, you have the sources. And these are all the database that are included in this database. So it's a database. You see, there's a lot. Um, it's a database of databases. So meaning that in case you have no idea of your species, it's nowhere found in your smaller focused taxonomic specialist, taxonomic group specialist database. Um, maybe you're not sure and you're not. So let's see, like I want to find Elianthus anus, which is the sunflower. Let's see, does it match somewhere? Oh, it, it matched in catalog of life, but it also matched in 32 data sources. And you see that it provides you with a score. It provides you with some information. So it was actually matching perfectly, exact, exact match from a curated source. And it's an accepted name. And it was it identified that it was well parsed by the parser. So with this tool, it's really like the last resort in the sense that if you have no match, maybe some of the names were used in some databases, more regional and not in global ones. So you can use this thing, this tool, to um, check uh, if your names were was found was found anywhere or not. And it uses, if you go into the detail, it uses very smart ways of cutting the the computation. So it, it's actually very very fast. Um, so I would recommend in case you have unmatched names to use these aggregated databases. They're, they're not perfect in the sense that they may give you bad matching, but they can give you an idea if the names is actually just purely mal malformed and there's no way you can recover the original names, I mean the proper name, or uh, if, it's, if it's just a name that is used in a, in a specific database and not in other ones. Another point of detail, author names. So you see me writing the names in total. Here, this thing actually gives scientific information. Depending on how much you're trained in taxonomy, maybe you realize that we actually include author names in the full taxonomy names we're giving. Because it actually helps distinguish between different species concepts. So only using genus and epithet is not enough to unambiguously identify a species. You actually need the author name and sometimes the year of publication when applicable. So I would encourage you whenever possible, and the problem is not all of the database allow it, to include author names. If you have author names in your original data, data set, use the author names because they give you more precise information. Uh, and yeah, unfortunately, not everyone is using them, but do use them if you if you can. Another point of detail is what is called fuzzy matching. Fuzzy matching is a thing that you have. It's um, is when you're matching names that are not right exactly written the same way. So possibly a typo. Um, so here's an example of like what fuzzy matching means. So you could fuzzy match, for example, Marie Ellen with Marie Ellen and Marie Ellen with missing spaces or hyphens. You can imagine matching Philip Charles Carr to Philip Carr just by removing Charles. And some of the databases in the tool I presented today actually implement some of this fuzzy matching. You have many different techniques that let you match two different strings, two different character strings that are slightly different or differently written. Sometimes they use phonetic similarity. Sometimes they use um, they rely on different ways of uh, different spelling different spelling uh, that exist. Uh, and some of them are, are smart enough. The thing is, it's very powerful. You can use it, but you have to handle it with very much care, uh, because, for example, it's possible that you can match a name into an outside taxonomic group because you have different taxonomic groups that are that share the same epithets, for example, even though from birds to plants. So, or being too, uh, or that you're matching very being too loose. So maybe you actually, the, 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 the database will output like a matching score, a high matching score, 
But the problem is because we are using fuzzy matching, it's actually not the name that you want it to match. So fuzzy matching is not matching exactly. It's sometimes nice, but you should handle it with care. What I would recommend is if you rely on fuzzy matching, maybe try, try to compare your workflows of with fuzzy matching and without and compare how many matches do you have and vary the threshold of matching to see the influence of matching your names. So if we summarize um, a little bit this part, what we, what we have today, the problem is what we had in this part, um, taxonomic harmonization has no one size fit all solution. Um, you need to check the data encoding and, and parse the name components because these are very important steps in order to match properly your data. Then you need to match your names on appropriate databases. I know, sounds fake, appropriate database. Keep in mind that you have criteria to select. So spatial scale, taxonomic breadth, date of update, number of synonyms. And then you can resolve the, the matches based on matching, matching scores. Uh, you can also, you have in the packages list that is provided in the paper, you have packages that can provide matching scores even using only flat files. If you don't have a taxonomic reference database in your field and you only have like one standard Excel file and another one on which you want to match to, it's also possible. I'm talking broadly about the case of database today, but it also works if you have two Excel sheets or CSV files. And then you definitely have to decide consciously what do you do with unmatched names? I'm saying deciding because the problem is if you don't take conscious decision about it, if you just drop them silently, you may miss a lot of your information. So this is where you have to think hard and maybe rely on this global aggregators like um, the global names with verifier. So I'm almost finished. Uh, what are my tech message and the grand summary of things uh, about taxonomic harmonization? So the grand summary of things says, taxonomic harmonization is a process of matching taxonomic names onto reference databases. I hope I convince you that it's a paramount thing for the data matching process when you're combining data. It is supported by databases of different spatial scale and taxonomic breadth, as well as a diversity of tools of which you should explore the landscape for like that you should explore before thinking of making your own tools. And maybe there's some appropriate tools for your taxonomic group of interest. Pre-processing name is very important to harmonize the taxonomy. And then you have to consciously think and decide about the matching process. Think about the scores in the threshold that you're using. Are you going to rely on fuzzy matching or not? Are you going to use author names or not? Et cetera, et cetera. This is part of the data, the data workflow that you're going to use. And you have to make conscious decisions there. 